Okay, well, the gym got real quiet there <laughs> right before we got this going. This is an interview that I've been looking forward to all week long because we get a chance today to talk to six rotation outside Peyton Ledman. The girls are going to head to Corpus Christi tomorrow, so I want to thank Peyton for being willing to sit down with us this afternoon. Yeah, no problem. So let me ask you this. I mean, this is something that several people have asked me and I don't know. I mean, let's go through your history a little okay. bit, okay? Um, first, you know, uh, we learned when you came here in your bio, your mom, your dad, your sister mm -hmm. are all athletes. What was, what was that like growing up in the Rudman house with all that athleticism? Um, well, I grew up in the gym basically. Um, like my mom was a coach um, ever since I was born and so I spent my time in the gym watching her practices and um, just always being in the gym and always going to my sister's games and I always just wanted to follow in their footsteps and it was it was all about sports in my house no matter what like Sundays we were our days revolved around church and football and like that's just how it went and so like it's awesome to be able to do what they did and just follow it up. So was every game of like checkers or board game or was, was did it have to turn into a competition? Oh, you have no idea. It gets <laughs> so intense in my house. Like we can barely make it through a board game like without one of us leaving and yeah. getting mad and competitive. It's yeah. crazy. Now all of all the people we just referred to, uh, sister and mom and dad, uh, were at Concordia, and you're from Liberty Hill, which is. Uh, on the, if I've got my geography right, the northwest mm -hmm. part of Austin in Concordia. Some of you may remember the Concordia, it used to be called Contour Concordia Lutheran College, but now they just call it Concordia University. Um, D3 school, and if, my, if I got my rules straight, D3 schools still don't offer scholarships. Mm -hmm. So uh, at some point you had to realize, you know, hey, I, I've, got a, I've got a chance to go play, to, you know, to get money to do this. Was there a little bit of break though? Was, has Concordia been kind of a family tradition? Did you think maybe you might wind up there? Um, honestly, I at first I didn't think about it at all. Um, I wanted to go D1. That was my dream ever mm -hmm. since I was little to play D1 volleyball. And um, I ended up at East Tennessee State. And um, after I left East Tennessee, Concordia was one of my options. But I just, I thought about it a lot and I still just like, my competitive nature um, still just wanted to fight for that dream of D1 volleyball, so I ended up here. I have been one time to East Tennessee State uh, on, an, on an academic trip. What was, the, what was the connection there? Where did you, was there somebody that approached you when you were playing club ball? How did you get from Austin to ETSU? Yeah, um, actually the assistant coach from ETSU saw me play um, at AAUs in Orlando and just emailed me and I had um, wanted to get out of Texas yeah. and just like explore new places sure. and um, so and my dad is actually from Morristown which is close to Johnson City and um, so I was really interested and um, yeah we just it was really random we just started talking and I took a visit and I loved it and so just ended up there. And then after a year of being there was it um, was it opportunity here? Was it sort of that had, that part of you that had wanted to get away had been satisfied? Or talk about the transition. And did you know anybody at Stephen F. Austin before you left for ETSU? Um, yeah, actually, I played for Adler my okay. 17th year of club. And um, that was a really fun year for me. He's an awesome coach to play for. And um, so uh, he was really my only connection here. Um, yeah. So, all right, so with that kind of, uh, history of how Peyton got here. Let, with the six rotation, we got lots, and I, I have to admit, that there's a lot, I want to get into a lot of facets of the game with you. You know, when you, with six rotation outside, it's got to be able to handle in-system shots. We talked about in an interview a few days ago, out-of-system shots, defense, you're going to serve. What part of all of that, um, attacking from the front row, attack, attacking from the back row, um, defense, serving, what part of that, part of your volleyball repertoire came first to you? Honestly, I think my um, defense and serve receive passing um, came first naturally to me. Um, serve receive is my favorite thing to do. I don't know why, but um, it like relaxes me and I have always just, um, that's always been my focus because my mom told me, she was a coach and she was uh -huh. like, if you can pass the ball, if you have good ball control, that's what 
coaches are looking for and so I was like okay I'm gonna really focus on my ball control passing and so that was really the first thing I focused on. Boy I hope any young volleyball player that happens to stumble on this listen to that <laughs> because that's what that's what you, that's what that's what you teach when girls are seven and eight <laughs> is learn to serve and, and serve receive. Um, you mentioned that it calmed you and the first couple of times I saw the team practice and the first couple scrimmages we had before we got into the regular season. I noticed that about you. You're very poised on the court. When we score, you celebrate with everyone else, but your demeanor is very level-headed. Is that something that you were taught because your parents were athletes, or is that something that you specifically focus on? Yeah, I was definitely not always like that. It was really hard in my um, early high school and early club years. Um, I would show my emotions very easily. I would get like really excited or really down on myself. and. Um, obviously, my parents being athletes, they had told me, like, people are looking at that, coaches are looking, and um, it wasn't just a one-time fix. I would have long talks with uh -huh. them after yeah. tournaments, after yeah. games, and it's just like, um, just how I was brought up. They always just um, wanted me to keep my negative emotions inside, and so yeah. they definitely taught me that yeah. early on. I think that is so true. It's not just... You're right, coaches can see it, but I think just people on the side, like myself, I notice that a lot in players too, when they when they get easily flustered after mistakes. Let's talk about, you talked about passing, and of course a lot of that receives happening in, on, on the back row. What makes a good back row attack, okay? I mean, I know that we've talked about before that there are times when the ball is completely out of system, and, and you know, after, match last week you talked about that Debbie had kind of a yes-no situation mm -hmm. with you. But how can an attacker who's being set specifically on the back row still see their shot? Um, well, we have been taught to um, always swing to the right side of the court if you have it to take that setter out. And so really um, when you swing back row, you it's very rare that you get a chance to just take a big rip, a big swing. So um, you have to know that 90% of the time your swing is just going to need to um, keep the ball in play and be smart and take the setter out. So um, you really just have to know how many blockers you have up and um, what you can do with them. It is so interesting that you said about 90% because one of the things I, with this segue question was I was trying to think about that number myself. What I wanted to ask you about that is, you know, as the, as the six rotation outside, I don't know that many people really that look at volleyball numbers understand this really well. It's tough to compare numbers across attackers' positions in volleyball. I mean, you have 510 attacks, which far and away leads the team, but at least 100 of those have got to be from the back row. i got to think. Yeah. You know? So does it ever, I don't know if I want to use the word discourage you or not, but do you ever feel misunderstood in some sense about, hey, you know, I'm you know, hitting 091 or I'm hitting 111 or, what, or wherever it sits. Do you ever feel like from a numbers game there's a misunderstanding of the back row having to take all those shots that usually aren't about kills, they're about, like you say, the 90% of getting it in? I mean, you had a good word choice. It is kind of discouraging after a game where you think you did well to go back to the locker room and get a stat sheet that says I hit below 200. And, um, but I don't know, I just have to keep reassuring myself about the next game, next game, and um, I don't know, it's just some days you're going to have good days and some days you're going to have off days, and um, I don't know, I just have to keep my errors down. Well, but I think, I think in, in, on, on that point, though, that you might have a front row hitter that never hits from the back that might hit 200. And you might hit 200 from the three rotations where you're on the front, mm -hmm. but then you know you take 20, 30 balls in a five-set match from the back and take 50 swings, and now all of a sudden, you know that 200 looks more like 100. What's that? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm definitely just getting being out there six rotations. I'm getting set. I guess I mean almost twice as much, and so right. it's when I'm getting all those attempts, it teams also start to stack up on me. And so I yeah. have um, a bigger block and I have um, 
defense reading more of my shots because you know there's only so much you can do and um, so I think the big thing for me is just keeping the ball in play and I think that's what the team needs right now is just a consistent player to um, get the other side out of the system. I think those are good points. That was one of the things when I first started getting into the number side of the game that I really had to remind myself that a middle blocker's attack percentage is not comparable to a right size, is not comparable to a three left, three rotation left side, is not comparable to a six rotation left side. Um, you mentioned receive. I want to talk about that. That's actually, you've synced up real well with some of the things I wanted to ask you in receive. Um, what's, what's the toughest type of serve for you to have to receive? The toughest type of serve would be a short float serve. The, the ones that drop just right in front of you because you never know where that ball is going to go. So, you know, you have a lot of people. We don't have that many in our conference, but we had a couple against Nichols and we had a few at Oral Roberts that were jump servers that were sort of top spin heavy, you know. Um, do you think those are easier balls to handle? <laughs> yeah, they're way easier to me because the ball really doesn't have much room to move. But other than that, uh, the jump serve on Oral Roberts, yeah, yeah, that, she was pretty good. <laughs> she, was, she had a really good serve. But once we made the adjustment to um, shift the line over to the right, we were passing threes every time on her. But, um, yeah, I love it when I see a girl get back there and throw the top spin because I'm like, okay, I got this ball. Yeah. That's very, very interesting. Um, I, you know, most of the time a crowd in volleyball is looking uh, perpendicular to court. But if you ever want to watch the effect of a float serve, get it, get behind, get 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 behind, get in, get behind where the receivers are. Explain to the people that are watching this that not every float serve is the same. I mean, you you can watch them and they'll zig all different ways, coming off all different players. I mean, like not even the server can control where it goes, so yeah. nobody else knows where it's going either. And um, it can go. It can float, it can drop down, it can float, drop down and then come back up, it can float sideways, and there's nobody in the gym knows where that ball is going. So. Yeah, a couple, usually at tournaments, you know, we'll sit uh, kind of behind to kind of watch one particular team, and that's when you can really see uh, a, lot, a lot of floats will, will move left to right. You'll actually see them zigzag in the air. Um, it's kind of like a knuckleball in yeah. baseball. Um, and last, I want to ask you, we mentioned a little bit at the top, but um, family. Talk a little bit about uh, family support. You mentioned you had a sister. Um, all through those years of club and being in Austin and going away to Tennessee and coming back, um, what's kind of family meant to you in terms of support? I don't even know where to start with that question. Um, I have relied on my family for anything and everything. I mean, since I started playing, and um, it's just, it's awesome to have this here, I have them here for me, um, and having them closer to home, I get to see, I get to see them every other weekend, if not every weekend, whereas last year I saw them twice in my first semester, wow. and it's just, to have that moral support behind me is, it's, it's just such a crazy difference, like having them here, and um, no matter how upset I get or stressed or overwhelmed, I can FaceTime my mom, text my dad, and they know exactly what I'm going through. So it's, I think having them um, being able to play sports in college, I can call or text any one of them at any time, and they don't look down on me. They don't, <laughs> they don't um, question why I'm so stressed, why I'm so yeah. upset. They're like, I know. I, I went through it too, and they have just really good advice for me. And so I think I got lucky being the youngest yeah. one because um, I get to just go off of all of them. So, yeah. Well, it's great to have you back in Texas and close to where you can have their support. Jax will, uh, I think, practice a little bit tomorrow, mm -hmm. I heard, uh, here at the end, and then bus ride it down to what's well, close to I mean, Corpus and Abilene, about the same far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bus trip tomorrow, everybody will need kind of books and <laughs> music to listen to and whatnot. And then after that, the Jacks will be over at Incarnate Word. We'll uh, be on the radio with you on Saturday from San Antonio and then out to Abilene next week, just a one uh, match week next week, and then home uh, against Central Arkansas and Northwestern State. So conference keeps rolling right along. Jacks 4-0. Thanks, Peyton, for being able to sit down and talk. Thank you so much.